Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On today's episode, I talk with Liz Keedy Norton, head coach of the Dartmouth Big Greens women's hockey team. We talk about her hockey playing and coaching background, her experiences with USA Hockey, and all about her vision for the Dartmouth women's hockey program. I really enjoyed this conversation with Liz, and I hope you do too. Before we get to today's amazing episode, I wanted to talk to you about the app part of Champs app. Did you know that there are over 30 NCAA coaches with Champs app profiles that you can connect with directly? These include coaches from every D1 conference. Champs app lets you create a free, beautiful online hockey resume to share with coaches, teams, and players. Your profile includes all the information coaches want to know to help decide if you are a player they want to keep on their recruiting radar. When you connect with coaches, they will receive automatic updates when you change your profile, add game or video, or alert them to upcoming games on your schedule. Just go to champs.app and click the sign up button to start your profile. You can check out the full list of the NCAA coaches using Champs app by clicking on the links in the show notes. I'm very excited to have on the podcast Liz Keedy Norton, head coach of the Dartmouth women's ice hockey team. Originally from Braintree, Massachusetts, Liz went to Milton Academy before playing for four seasons at Princeton, where she was a captain in her senior year. In 2010, she played professionally for the Boston Plays, and after that, she held various coaching roles, including Andover High School, Union College, Harvard University, and Boston University, before getting her first D1 head coaching job with the Dartmouth Big Green in 2021. And just recently, she was an assistant coach with the USA Hockey at the Under-18 Women's World Championship. Welcome to the podcast, Liz. Thanks. So thank you so much for me finally being able to say mission accomplished on getting at least one representative of every single D1 women's hockey team. Dartmouth is the last team that I've been trying to get on the, the, the podcast, and thank you for finally agreeing to, to join me. You bet. Um, so like we do all, I guess, why don't we start a little bit with your hockey background and how you started playing hockey, uh, I'm assuming somewhere close to Braintree, Massachusetts, and then going on and playing at Milton Academy. Uh, yeah, for sure. So I'm I'm one of four, and so I have two older sisters and a younger brother. And for me, uh, my sisters and I actually started off figure skating, and then um, the three the three of us quit. It was just it was super expensive, and so we got out of it for a little bit. And then when my brother started playing, I joined him. So I think I started playing hockey in like fourth grade, um, and just uh, I played with the boys through through eighth grade before Milton, and um, I also played at Aspet Valley. Uh, just a local club around here, and that's sort of where I, where I got started. And do your parents feel that it was a real cost savings for you playing ice hockey instead of figure skating, since it was so too expensive? <laughs> well, I, I think they went from from three figure skating to two playing hockey, and there was a little, little gap in between there. But um, for ultimately, probably not. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure it was even at best. Gotcha. And and um, when you you were were you quite the goal scorer back then? Because I know you you were so in college. So I was wondering, you know, you know how you knew you were actually a pretty good player and how you chose to end up playing at Princeton. Yeah, um, I think uh, like I I always just worked hard, and so I don't know that I'd consider myself like a goal scorer or X type of player. But um, like the way we were raised, it was like hard work comes first. And so for me, like, I'd like to think I was like a gritty 200 foot player. Um, and with that, like lots of opportunities came, but I had some really good coaches along the way and who encouraged me. And when it came to prep school or the college process, honestly, my, my family had such limited exposure to it. Um, neither of my parents went to college, never mind played a sport in college. And so um, everything starting with prep school right through that process was really, really new to us. And um, I was fortunate enough to have opportunities, and as they came, I tried to take the most advantage of them. But um, it de it definitely wasn't like a super smooth process at any point. Gotcha. And and which coach had the biggest impact on you during your youth hockey days? Uh, youth youth hockey, uh, Greg Carter for sure. I was really really lucky to have him um, at Asabit, and um, he coached me with with boys and with girls, and I probably had him for about five straight years, and. Just his his knowledge for the game, his passion, the way he communicated, and and the way he believed in me was was really helpful as a younger player. Gotcha. And and how did you end up at Princeton from Asset and and Milton? Um, honestly, like through the recruiting process, I feel like Jeff Campersall was fairly relentless. Like we we didn't really know anything about Princeton and. Like being a, a kid from Boston, um, like that was a little bit outside my my distance range, but. Um, 
he he came and did a home visit and like he was really invested in me and my career and like I, I felt obligated to to go tour there um and then from from there like I loved it and I really liked him and um he's he's made a huge difference in in my hockey career but just my life in general and I feel like once once I was there I loved it and I felt like any goals I had, he believed in, and he was willing to support me like as, mu as much as anyone I had ever met. Gotcha. And for folks who don't know, Jeff Campersall is now the head coach at Penn State, but he was at the head coach for Princeton for, for many, many years. Yeah. Gotcha. And um, you actually took a break for a year uh, between your second and third year at Princeton to be centralized with the, um, the U.S. national team. Can you talk about that experience um, and then talk about how hard it was then to actually probably um, not make the team? We've had a bunch of folks who made the team and who haven't made the, the, the Olympic team and talk about the challenges of, of going through that centralization process. Yeah, for sure. To, to start with, um, like getting picked or any opportunities with USA Hockey, um, for me, like I said, as a player, I always just tried to like work, work as hard as possible and like know that whatever my process was, I had done everything in my control, like to be to be be the best for myself, my family, and for whatever team I was playing for. And so, um, playing for USA was always a dream. And um, it started with making a, a U22 team the summer before, which led to like my first national team for Four Nations, and then in the in the spring of my uh that would have been my sophomore year and um i had a pretty bad injury that like took me out for a little bit before um the 2005 2006 pre-olympic tour so honestly like coming back um i was really grateful to have made it but i'm not sure that i was ever ever 100 percent um throughout that throughout that process and so um, it was an awesome experience like i played with and against the best for you know a year of my life and um, I had I had great coaches and people who really supported me and and at Princeton Jeff was super supportive of the year off and all of that and um, like get, getting cut was certainly um, it, it was devastating like you you find out like the day before Christmas and like I was the last forward on the team cut and for me like the perspective of like you don't see the positive at that point like that you made it that far and you beat so many other people out like you just like for I just felt like I had let so many people down that had invested in me and like at, at that moment like it wasn't about me it was about like I felt like I had let like I had taken a year off and then I didn't turn in anything and like I had coaches and parents and that had given up so much for me to be the player that I was and um so if that was that was really hard and I think like my perspective on it now is like I know that I did everything that I could to put myself um in a position to succeed and like I, I learned a lot about myself and um, as a hockey player and and I think just the process of that and going through that is like it it's something that you learn from like 10 years later. Yeah, yeah. And do you feel that if uh, you, you weren't injured that you actually could, would have been closer to, to making the team? Um, I, I would certainly, I would certainly hope so. Um, I mean, like be, being the last one cut there, like you got to think you're on the, on the edge anyways. Um, but yeah, for, for me, like it was, it just took, took a long time to come back from, like I, I was injured in our last series, um, like last playoff series at Yale. And so that kept me out of like the world, the world's tournament that April. And then um, I probably started skating like right at the beginning of August and tryouts are like two weeks later. So in terms of like running head start and um, yeah, the, the timeline just wasn't, wasn't ideal. Gotcha. And and do you still hold resentment against uh, Yale as as a team based on your injury? No, no, no. Yale Yale had nothing to do with it. it I don't love playing in that playing or coaching in that right now, but um, <laughs> it had nothing to do with. It. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So um, let's talk about um, you know your your post. Uh, playing days at, at Princeton, um, you know, you played at least one year professionally for the Boston Blades. And then how did you, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were also started your coaching uh, career at, at around the same time. Tell us, tell us about what you did right after graduation. Yeah. So after graduation, I was still involved with the national team and that, and I was training. And so I played with the Blades and then um, I started like actually coaching. I, I worked at a gym that my husband and I now own um, IPF and like, that's where I first, like, got the taste for, like, hey, I really like coaching and, like, just, I mean, the age groups, it's really wide range of, like, from adults to youth athletes to whoever can, can train there. And so 
that's sort of where I got into coaching and feeling like, hey, this this could be something that I really like. Um, and then I started coaching at Andover High School and I coached both hockey and lacrosse there. And it, it certainly at the time wasn't the level that I was super excited about, but I really liked the high school age group. And for me, it was a, a really good start to, if I was going to coach at a higher level, like you just have to break things down differently. You have to adapt to different different scenarios. And um, so it was a really good experience overall there. Gotcha. And how did you get that first D1 opportunity in Schenectady with, uh, with Union College? Um, so, yeah, so I had heard about the opportunity. And so I reached out to Claudia Barcom, who was the coach there at the time. And I, I ended up going on an interview and I just felt like sh she and I connected and had some similar values and that it, that it could be a good fit. And for for me, I went up there with like Union was never like my ultimate goal of like, hey, this is where I want to be. But it gave me a it gave me a really good start and a really good perspective on like how, how to recruit, how to talk to people, like the wide range of things that as an assistant you have to do, whether it's it's video or travel or this and that. And um, so I was there for for a year with her before um, Katie Stone at Harvard called and, and for me, like getting back home was always the goal um, to be a little, a little bit closer to my family. And um, it, it was also nice to have an Ivy League opportunity and to work for someone new. So things sort of lined up that way there. Gotcha. And so what is it about the coaching profession that, that you really get excited about? And, and still this, you know, this many years later are still, um, you know, very excited to be, to be doing. Yeah. So for, for me, I think it's a little bit about like, I love the sport, like I'm competitive. And so like, it's a profession that I get to go and compete every weekend. And um, it's also, it's a sport that's given me so much. And I feel like the number of doors hockey opened for me, like from getting my education to different places I've been and experiences I've had, like, it's sort of my small way of, of giving back and like helping the next generation of young women. Um, for me, like Jeff Campersall played a huge role in like in my confidence. And I feel like at times he believed in me more than I believed in myself. And like, if I can have that effect on, on one player, like it, it'll all be worth it for me. Um, so I really like the competitive piece, but I also like that, like you're a role model for young women and um, you're sort of like the coaching part, like sometimes is like 10% of the job and like how you help them in the rest of their lives is the other 90%. Yeah, and, and um, you moved from Harvard, uh, just basically a couple miles away, to uh, Boston University. Uh, and you spent almost six years there um, coaching with uh, Brian DeRoche. And um, Brian has been really well known as being kind of a creating a coaching tree. Uh, many coaches have gone on to be head coaches elsewhere, like Katie LaChapelle, uh, Crystal Matthews, who's gone away and come back, um, yourself. Uh, Tara Watchorn, all, all these folks who've been guests on, on the podcast. Maybe just talk about uh, coaching with uh, Brian DeRoche and kind of what you learned from him and how it's, it's made you a, a, a head coach, where, gotten to you where you are today. Yeah, so that, that was certainly a, a calculated decision. Like I was in a great spot and um, Katie had been great, great at Harvard for me. But um, to work for Brian, like he's just such a tremendous human. And I think the way he conducts himself in, in all areas of, of his life is great. And he, he has helped a lot of people go on to their next jobs. And I think what he did for me there was like, he empowered me to like, take on different things or different challenges. And like, he just let me, let me do it and run with it. And he would certainly give, give feedback or advice and let me know how he had done things. And so I, I learned a tremendous, tremendous amount from him just by like working with him every day, but watching him like he, he's a guy who knows everybody he's like known for handwritten thank you letters and just like he he treats people with like such kindness and um I, I think he's he's done so much for our sport that it, it was a really good experience and I, I loved every minute of being there with him Yes, and the handwritten stuff, I, I can acknowledge firsthand that I've seen him at several recruiting events, and he has nothing digital with him, and it's all pen and paper as he's sitting along the glass, taking notes on every player that he's looking at. So uh, very consistent uh, with, with his recruiting and his, uh, and his personal relationship. So um, that's great to hear. All right, so we're going to get into Dartmouth in just a second, but you just came back from Sweden um, with the under-18 team, um, and I'm, I'm, congratulations on, on winning bronze, but at the same time, I'm 
pretty sure you probably wanted a, a different color metal. So I, I have a couple of quick questions for you. First, we'll, we'll go through the easy one. As I kind of mentioned, uh, Tara Watcher and also coached, coached at BU. I believe you were uh, uh, assistants or associates together. Um, but she was helping up Hockey Canada. I was just wondering, were you able to fraternize with the enemy or was this truly like a rivalry series and you guys didn't see each other and, and you kept your distance from each other? Uh, just, no, no, just a, just a little bit. Um, I mean, it's, it's all when you're over there, but, um, and, and it definitely is a rivalry thing, but on the flip side, like women's, women's hockey is, is so small and everybody knows everyone. And so, um, like I have a tremendous amount of respect for their staff and, and certainly what they did over there. So there, there's lots of interactions in, in the in-between, if you will. Okay, gotcha. And, and of course, their head coach was also from Princeton. So, you know, obviously there's that relationship as well. So, yeah, um, with Courtney Castle. All right. So now, now let's get to the, the real question about what happened in Sweden. Um, so I've, I've rewatched the game and I specifically saw that, um, you know, there were three penalties that led to both goals that Sweden scored. And, and don't get me wrong, Sweden was an outstanding team. And I wasn't surprised that they, they, they made it to the finals. I just thought they may have beaten a different team to get there. Um, so how mad was Katie Lachapelle about those three penalties? that it ended up uh, causing the two power play goals for Sweden? Uh, well, I think, it, I think it's hard not to be mad about those um, and like get, up, get upset about those because uh, the result isn't what anyone wanted over there. But on the flip side, like there's, there's a lot of hockey to be played in 60 minutes and like there's, there's plenty of other things that, that we probably could have controlled or, or done better or, or responded differently from. So I think ultimately, like, yes, the penalties are one thing, but like you have to look at the whole body of work and and like what we what we had on our roster and um just i think there's just so many variables okay i gotcha i gotcha so looking back is there anything that you or the staff feel that you could have done differently or you kind of yeah you, you played the cards that you were dealt um i like to think that like we played the cards that we were dealt and to some degree like i'll, I'll give sweden a lot of credit I, I thought they played really well i thought they were well coached and they have they they play a thorough game and they have a lot of depth and um, on, honestly like their progress for me like is now it has been fun to watch but um, I think you you can always do things better and there, there's probably a million a million different like I'd like to rewind and do a little bit differently um, just just because you you're analyzing the results and the results not what you wanted. Yeah, and full kudos to, to Sweden. I, I believe they had a very senior team returning for that just played in in the in the uh, July tournament, and they were also playing at home in a packed barn. I mean, that place was full for that game. So that must have been pretty exciting to playing in such a, a great atmosphere. Oh, that that was really exciting. I mean, for for me, like it's exciting for our game, like that you can sell out arenas and um, like in in northern Sweden and have like that much energy, and it's it's a really good sign for the future of our game. I think. Absolutely. It's great for the game. Yeah, and, it was, and it was pretty far away from Stockholm. I think it was like almost a six hour drive. Is that correct? Yeah, it was about six hours and felt like 10 for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for answering those questions about the under 18s. I, um, uh, and, and congratulations on, on winning bronze and, and representing USA hockey and, and, and the country. So let's move over on how you ended up coming to uh, Dartmouth and what that process was like. I know um, I read one article where uh, prior to your arrival, basically, the, um, the school had expressed uh, – frustration and that they were tired of losing and so they, they brought you in to, to 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 get more wins on the board yeah um so that for me like I've I've always wanted to be a head coach and that's been the goal um but it also has to be at a certain place and so like I talked a little bit about like hockey is one piece of it and then there's the rest of like the student athlete experience and like helping develop young women and like preparing them for the real world. And so for me, like academics has always been really important. Like I, I went to an Ivy League, I believe in the Ivy League. And I think that it's a it's a huge role, especially for young women. And so um, Dartmouth being in the Ivy League, that that made it more attractive. And um, I am competitive and, and just like Dartmouth and the, the people who hired me, like I, I do want to win too. And I think that's the trajectory we're on. But the, the process for me was like seeing if it was a good fit and for me a good fit is like do we have all the resources that student athletes can come here and be successful like whatever their goals are so if they want to play on a senior national team if they want to be the best player in NCAA or the best player for Dartmouth that we can support them and, and what does that look like and and I did, I did my due diligence in terms of like support staff and resources and and we we have it at Dartmouth and um, 
whether it's uh, looks like your you know your strength and conditioning coach and resources and uh, your facilities and support staff and academic support and all of that like our our kids they can look left and right wherever they are on campus and feel like they're supported and there's this safety net around them that is rooting for them to be successful and that that makes my job a lot easier um, and so for me it was it was finding a place where like I could be a head coach I felt like I could be impactful and a place that I believed in and that I could eventually win at. And so like Dartmouth checked those boxes for me. And then like through the interview process, like I was able to meet the players and some of the, the other coaches who work there. And, and that was sort of like sealed the deal for me that, Hey, if I'm offered this job, I would take it because I felt like the, the players and I had similar, like similar goals, similar values, and like that the change that they needed. And I thought I could bring is, is what they wanted. Gotcha. Okay. Very, very helpful to understand the background and, and why you took the, the job. And let's just get some basics out of the way. So Dartmouth is located in uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, which is about a couple hours north of Boston. Um, and as we kind of said, it's an Ivy League school um, and you play at Thompson Arena. Maybe just give folks a background on the actual school, um, you know, the academics, and, and then you, you kind of touched on it, but a little bit more about the facilities uh, that, that you have to work with. Yeah, so the school-wise, like one one separating factor for us in the Ivy League is we're the smallest Ivy League by about 25%. So there are about about 4,500 undergrads, and then we have we have four graduate schools there too. But like academically, like our our professor to student ratio is is one to seven, so it's pretty small. And that that doesn't mean there aren't bigger bigger classes, but it means that like you'll know your professors, and academically, like they're going to take vested interest in in your life, which is which is really cool. And um, we're also on trimesters. So like kids only take three classes at a time and there are three three trimesters and you could take classes in the summer if you want. But to me as a student athlete, like three is really manageable. Um, like like it, it sounds nice to me as, as someone looking in. Um, but so that's what the academic side sort of looks like. And it's liberal arts. So our, you can do literally whatever you want in terms of major and there's a lot of flexibility and you can you can sort of do modified majors or major in something and minor in something something else and so our kids they do it all in terms of academics and then for us like Thompson Arena like I love that rank it's it's beautiful it's clean it's historic and um we're actually we'll be undergoing a of um at the end of the year here um which will be exciting and it'll be new locker room and and all of that but um for like for us, I think it's like the location. It's um it's about two and a half hours north of Boston. It's small, like we have a big campus. It's beautiful. It's um everybody lives on campus, and it's I think the biggest separating factor is the community. Um, so like kids, they're involved in in everything, and um, there's a lot of athletic support between different teams, and just um, it's a smaller, tight knit community where you feel like people really care. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, let's turn turn it back to to the um, actual hockey team. So in the early 2000s, Dartmouth made four of the first five women's Frozen Four um, and captured four ECAC titles. Um, but that seems like a long time ago. Uh, since then, been more towards the bottom of the ECAC. So what what's been your plan to to kind of get you back making the playoffs even for the ECAC? Yeah, so it's obviously um, like it's a day to day process, and there's like I think there's a few parts to it. It's um, it's developing what you have currently, and like a getting the most out of what you have, and then making them better. And and there are probably two different plans there. And then it's also through recruiting, and it's through culture. And so like I think I think culture is sort of a big buzzword. And for me, I like to focus on the environment, which I consider like what does every day look like? What energy is there? What's, what does support look like? And so like our, our staff tries to bring, uh, like believe in what we have and like encourage them to like go overachieve. Like I always talk about like, hey, work as hard as you can be as prepared as possible. And like, we always control our attitude, our effort and our response. And if you can control those, like you're going to get as good an outcome as you can right now. And then we'll work on, on building for tomorrow. So I think in, in general, like we've had, I think we've had about like one eight goal losses this year. Right. And so like you're, you're right on the edge and it, it's like boiling water. Like there's a lot of work being done and you can't really see it yet. But I do, I do think that the kids in the locker room, like they feel it and they see it and they know that they're, 
their work is setting them up for success, like not necessarily right now, but for tomorrow and for next season and, and the future. And um, I think it's a, it can feel like a really slow process. It's also like they've seen results and they've won more, more games in the past two years than they had in the four before that. And so if we can keep, keep that going, I think we'll be in a pretty good spot in next year and even the year after. Yes, and you have a pretty young team, correct me if I'm wrong, but all but five of your players are either first or second year players. So, um, and from some of my analysis on looking at who are the, the teams, who are the top teams, they tend to be very heavy on uh, third and fourth and sometimes fifth year players. So, um, uh, you know, where are you on, on your path to, to kind of peaking as a team? Yeah, and so I would say that's a, that's a huge factor for us. So if you look at our decor, like we, we have two juniors, but they didn't play there like they didn't play their freshman year. So they don't, this is their second season of college hockey. And so like, if you look at a roster and you have no D that are basically upperclassmen, they're really young and it's great for them because they're getting a lot of minutes. And we, we have three freshmen D this year that are, you know, those kids are playing 20 minutes a game and that's awesome for this year. So they can develop for next year. Um, our goalies are, they're freshmen and sophomores. And um, so I would say like the, the future is really bright as long as like we hang in there and, and keep believing and keep developing for sure. Gotcha. And you just hit on point. One of the questions I was going to ask you is how come you only have two goalies on, on your roster? Um, I've looked at all 42, well, I guess it'd be 41 teams. Um, and there's only two other teams that only have two goalies. Um, what, what's your thinking behind that? Cause I ha also haven't seen any public announcements of a commit for 2023 or 2024 goalies. Yeah. You know, we have, we definitely have goalies coming in, in, in 2024. Um, but we like we had three at the beginning of this year, and then uh, like an injury took took one of them away. So for this year, like that's once once the school year started. So you go from three to two like that, and um, two is definitely not the goal. It's not it's not ideal. It's um, you need you need three. So they're uh, like they're troopers, and they're they're doing their best, and they're helping our team in in more ways than they'll they'll probably know. But um, two is what we got for now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a, a kind of a more recent question about you. So you, you had a, a, an interesting weekend. So you, you lost uh, a big time to, to Colgate on the uh, Friday game, but then you came back to beat Cornell on Saturday at Lina, which is a huge deal. 5-1. Um, was, was that your biggest win of the year or maybe even biggest win of your coaching for head coaching career? Um, yeah, I would think so. Like um, for for us, like at this point, like we're taking it, it game by game. And I thought like two things, like Colgate played really, they played really well. And I thought our, our team came out strong and it was tight for about half of the game. Basically like it was tight until it wasn't. Um, but like for me, like the things that I look back, like look back at and focus on for like our progress and development are like our kids played really hard, like despite the results on Friday night, like they played hard. Um, like all, all 60 played about 20 minutes each and like they battled and there was no give up and like I loved our bench energy and so like those are the positives like that despite the outcome like people were in a good place and we were together and we played hard but that also means that the next day like then you get to travel to Cornell and you're tired and you're beat up and you have a million reasons to like pack it in because you're playing a top 10 team and at their building and like everything sort of stacked up against you so for me like when we came out as hard as we did and as unified as we did, like that's, that's the progress that we've made. And so, yeah, like, I think that win would have been big for us, no matter what, like I, I have a lot of respect for Cornell and what they've done with their program and the players that they have for sure. And um, like, I, I like winning no matter what, but <laughs> um, it, it definitely was a big one, big win. And for us now, it's just like, you're on a, on a Quinnipiac in Princeton this weekend. Yeah, it doesn't get any easier uh, when going up against Quinnipiac uh, this weekend. All right, so, um, and, and this will come out uh, right after that, that weekend, but uh, so that folks will know the results of the, those games from, uh, from Quinnipiac and Princeton. So, um, but did you feel that, uh, I know one of your philosophies is to outwork everyone and outcompete everyone. Uh, certainly looked that way on the game on uh, Saturday against, um, against Cornell. Do you feel like that, that, that really held up, that philosophy? Yeah, I feel like it it did, and it was one of, like, it was a game that we showed up for 60 minutes and no back down, and um, even if things weren't perfectly, like, when we were hemmed in our D zone there for a little bit, or, like, no matter what, there there was a lot of fight, and there were a lot of people doing 
some really little things that make a make a really big difference consistently and like that that focus and discipline is what's going to change our team from like a bottom team to the middle of the pack team Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about your coaching staff. So uh, Nina Rogers has been there with you now for a couple of years. And then this is uh, Max Gavin's first year with you. Talk about the, the coaching staff, uh, a little bit about their background, how you divide responsibilities. Yeah. Um, they, they've both been great. And like Max, Max runs the D and Nina runs the Fords and um, they're, they both bring a lot of energy. And for me, like, I like to think of us as working as a, a cohesive unit and, um, like we each bring different ideas and have different preferences on like players we like and this and that. And so it's sort of, sort of combining all of that, but, um, they, uh, they buy into the process of developing kids and, and also just being like good humans and caring about the, all the other pieces that really matter in these kids' lives. And so that's why I think like that they'll be effective and that that's why I have them on my staff. Gotcha. Um, so actually, we will now start shifting the conversation a little bit to the recruiting side of things. I, I have seen Max at, at several recruiting events um, or, or just watching games. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you and the staff have different perspectives on, on which kind of players you like. Well, tell me about those conversations. What are those like in terms of how you say, well, we, we, we think this is the better, uh, you know, this potential recruit is a better fit for us than, than this other player? Yeah, so like for me, we're we're in a little bit of an in between of like the types of players we can get. Like obviously, you're going to go after the best ones no matter what. But in the, in that next layer, like you have to decide like what what qualities you care the most about. And so, like work ethic, compete, um, th those things are like sort of my non negotiables. Like that has to just be like, hey, you're parking in between lines. Like that's what we do here at Dartmouth. But um, after that, like I I like. I like people who can play fast and play with their head up and like skating is really important to me. Um, and Nina, like Nina focuses on like IQ and like, can they make the next play and will everything translate? And so like, we'll go back and forth on like, what's more valuable and like, do, does this really work for us? Or like, is she going to be too slow for the next level? I think we all have different preferences and I've always said like, that's what I want on my staff. And like, I don't want just a yes person because like I'm only one set of eyes and like, I, I can't miss games during the year for like to be out on the road recruiting. And so like, there's got to be a certain level of trust. And for me, like that trust comes from like their due diligence, like how thorough they are and like that they, they know what I want, but they also know what our team needs. And so it's a, it's a discussion that I really like. And I think it's, it's really interesting because between like the, the portal and like so many like new teams coming and just like the game is growing so much, which is really great, but it means like th there's a lot of choices for college coaches. More competition, just like in, on and off the ice now. Yeah. Gotcha. So um, maybe you can just talk about something that we've talked about uh, on the podcast. And I've also had, um, you know, off the record conversations with several Ivy League coaches is the challenge of recruiting players to come play in the Ivy League, mostly due to financial reasons. Maybe you can just talk about some of the challenges of recruiting just in general for Ivy League teams and, and how you try and address them. Yeah, so I think certainly the financial piece is a challenge, but on the, on the flip side of that, I think part of it is that like families don't know that like the Ivy League is going to meet your need. And so like this is, this is a possible option and it might not be the perfect and it might not be perfect for you and it might not be free, but it is, it is doable for everyone. Like if you believe in the investment and for me, like I talk about the Ivy League being like, it's your four for 40 investment. Like you're going there for four years. It'll change the next 40 of your life. And, but getting people to see that up front is like part of it is like their exposure to it what they know about it what they don't know about it and um, you're competing with people who are they're paying for their education in full and like kids are kids are getting extra money now too and so that's definitely a challenge and I think the two other pieces are like the academic challenge like can they get in and can they be successful and then I think the third challenge is sometimes you have the perfect candidate and they it would work financially for them and they can get in but they're not sure if they can do it and so like they think that it'll be too stressful or too much of a struggle and like high high achieving hockey players like they don't want that to be a burden on on their hockey career like hey if I if I can't survive there whereas 
I think that I think the total opposite. And as as a player who did it, like there are so many resources at these schools, and, and admissions does a, a really good job making sure like they're taking in people who can be successful. And like the the kids we've talked to, like just through the recruiting process, like they've already accomplished so much. They're just like unaware of how much they've done and. Like college gets so much easier for these kids because they're not playing five games on a weekend and traveling from here to there and like all their meals are set up and everything's in one spot and like things get people always ask like how you manage it and what that transition looks like and honestly like I think it gets way easier. Uh, especially yes if you've been that disciplined getting getting to the point where you're being recruited by an Ivy League team absolutely. Right. Um, so, so one, one of the specific conversations that I've had with a couple of coaches is trying to lay out specifically the financial return on investment of going to an Ivy League. So what, what's your best way to express that to a potential recruit on here's how, how it will pay back the, um, you know, the, the, um, the financial element of investing in an Ivy League education? Yeah. And so like for me, like it, it's just going to open up so many doors that you're going to be able to control your destiny for the, the rest of your life. And in whatever, whatever profession you go into, like, you'll be so, so prepared for it and have so many transferable skills. And so like, like any education, like to some degree, it's what you, what you make of it. Um, but in terms of like the actual, the actual return, it's, I, I don't think it's just in like the financial piece. I think it's in like the alumni network and the friendships you make and the experience you have. Like there are so many things that you'll take away from it that it's certainly hard to calculate. And I think that's why it's like sometimes hard for people to wrap their heads around like a certain number with like the unknown of what the other side looks like. But to me, it's also like it, it's what you value. Like what do you want? Like how much do you care about education? What do you want the rest of your life to look like? And that's that's different for so many different people um but i think it's certainly uh like it's a, a privilege to play in the ivy league i think it's uh it, it's certainly something that's benefited me tremendously and um and hopefully like more and more people see that at an ivy league like you really can do like you can go and become an olympian you can go and become an olympian and a doctor or like sort of it the, the ball is in your court and for for me i think that's really cool Got it. Gotcha. So um, I, I looked at your roster and I noticed you have a large number of players who came from prep school. So do you have to go to a prep school to, to go to Dartmouth? No, absolutely not. Um, I would say like our trend will probably be getting away from, from some prep school kids. Um, not that there's anything, anything wrong with, with prep schools, but like I would like our, our locker room to be a little bit more diverse and I also think that there's um, like there's definitely pros and cons to to prep schools, but um, just because that's how how it looks now is I would say it's probably not how it would look in the future. Gotcha. So, what are the type of players that you're looking for, other than you know they outwork and outcompete everybody? What what are some of the other attributes that that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, I like um, I care about what kind of teammate you are. I care about body language, how coachable you are. And I think those things matter if you're going to get the best out of yourself and be the best for our team. And so, like, how, how well you receive coaching really matters to me. Um, how you treat your teammates. Um, are you respectful on the road? Are you th Those are all little things that I don't think people think that much about, but I really care about. And um, just, like, what, how much you love the game. Like, I think it's, there are a lot of people that they might want an Ivy League education or they might they might want to play college hockey, but like, I want people who love hockey and like, they want to be at Thompson. They want to be at the rank and they really love it because it's a really long sport. And it's like, we have the longest division one season. And I think if you don't love it, it just gets that much harder. Yeah. And, and, and the Ivy league season is shorter than, you know, the, the, the majority of teams out there as well. So yeah, you definitely, if you want to be playing college hockey, you got to really love hockey. So yeah. Got yeah. it. Um, and, uh, you know, you've now been recruiting, um, you know, for, for many, many years and now as, as a head coach. Um, what are the challenges of where we are at today, as you kind of mentioned with the transfer portal, um, still with folks having an extra year, especially in the Ivy League um, because of the shutdown year? Um, what are some of the challenges uh, that you're seeing today with, with the recruiting process um, from a parent or player perspective? 
Um, I think rosters are really, they're really full and there are a lot of unknowns with it. So um, like coaches haven't made decisions if they're keeping kids for an extra year or not. And that means that they might not know how many they want and year a year could be, there might be 50% less spots in your year because it's a COVID year. And I think that's really challenging for the next wave of players because there aren't 50% less of recruits, right? And so like women's hockey is growing, but the number and the numbers of schools supporting it is growing, but not at the same rate. So it's really tough, um, I think, from a player and parent perspective. Um, I also think that there are so many variables in terms of like, I, I might like a different player than another coach might like and what kind of school do they want and does the school align with like the, their hockey ability, their needs and where they're valued. And so I think there's a lot of variables that like go both ways. And it is like, I always tell recruits, like you're interviewing us too. Like, do you want to be with us for four years? Do you like this campus? Do you like these players? And like, could you see yourself being really successful here? Because just because we have a spot doesn't mean that that's a great fit for you or for your family. Um, so it's like, they have to do their due diligence too. Gotcha. And so last couple of questions. So we, we are now uh, at the end of January, early February. Um, so where are you at in the, the recruiting process for 2024s and 2025s? Because I'm assuming 2023s is uh, fully committed for you at this point. So where are you at, just generally speaking, within within both those things um, and looking at players still? Yeah, so so we're still we're still looking at, at players for for 24. Um just to be to be thorough, like we're we're pretty close with that with that class, but um, you like you never know. Like it's really hard to see everyone and make sure. And also, like these years are so like they're so critical for development for kids. So, someone that you saw at the first tournament in the fall versus in April will be very different. And so, I like to keep a little bit of of wiggle room so that when you see a kid that. Because for me, like progress and development is the standard. And so like when they're, when they've made a huge leap like that, that kid becomes a lot more attractive to me. Um, so I'd like to say like, we don't really rush it and we keep a little bit of, of, of wiggle room, if you will, so that we can try and make the best decision for our team. And then for 25, like obviously um, th that class is, is too young to talk to, but like where we're at is we're gathering information on like, hey, who, who are our top lists of position and what information do we need to know about them to figure out like, hey, would they be a good fit? Like, is this an option? Um, is like this, is this process going to be worth our time? And, um, and just like, what else do we need? Like basically finding out what else do we need to know about them before you decide to call them or not call them on June 15th. Gotcha. And um, sorry, just a follow-up question to, to that one related to it is how important are things like state playoffs, nationals, um, and just regular season games in that evaluation for folks you're, you're considering to talk to on June 15th? Um, so I think that they're all really important for different reasons, um, which might not be a good answer, but like, so when you go to something like nationals, that's, that's like the best against the best for the most part. And it's, um, like the quality of hockey is is better for the most part and you've weaned out some of like the weaker teams and all of that but it's also it's one weekend right so it's a small sample size right so i think like hey some people play up for those weekends and some people might have an off weekend and so like i'm not willing to judge it judge a player just on like one of those and i also think it's good to see a player like how do they react when they're up by a lot and they're blowing a team out and what does that look like or what does it look like when they're getting blown out and maybe they're getting sat and the game's not going their way. So like, I sort I sort of like to see players in all sorts of different environments, but um, na nationals and the end of the year stuff is in important to me because I think, like I said, that's where you can see their progress from the beginning of the year. Um, and then over the summer, like whether it's like USA hockey or Canada camps, like th those become a little bit more critical as you're like really narrowing down your search. Gotcha. Okay. Now, truly the last question. Um, what, what, what advice do you have for players or parents who are kind of um, going through the process right now and, and feeling the stress of uh, not, not finding a spot just yet? Um, I mean, my, my advice would be like, everybody's process is so, is so different. And 
Um, like you can look across different sports and, you know, NFL drafts and NBA drafts and like people, people go on drafted that then like go on to be league MVPs. And like the process is certainly not, it's not perfect, but it doesn't mean that there's not a spot somewhere for you. But my, my advice would be like, do your due diligence and stay open-minded and like stay the course, whatever it is. And so like, if you continue to develop and become a better player, like more options are gonna, they're gonna open up for you. It just might not be on like the perfect timeline. And then like when you're gathering information, like sometimes it doesn't work out at places and, and that's a really good thing, even though it might be disappointing in the moment. Like if you're not wanted at a place, even if you wanted to go there, like, is that really the best fit? Um, and I think that's sometimes hard because you're talking about young kids who this is their dream and their parents have invested so much in it, but ultimately like you want to, you want a good, a good fit and you want the right fit, like not just a fit. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, Liz, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, it was great to learn about your, your hockey background, definitely going deep on a couple areas of USA hockey. And of course, learning about Dartmouth and uh, what you're doing with the program and, and kind of even the recruiting process and, and what your thoughts are in there. So thank you much for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really want to thank Liz for coming on the podcast and sharing her insights about the recruiting process, choosing the Ivy League in Dartmouth, and her coaching philosophies. If you want to connect with Liz, you can do so on the Dartmouth website or her Champs app profile. Links to both are in the show notes. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Before you go, I wanted to share more about the app in Champs app. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know I spend a lot of time talking with coaches, parents, and players about the hockey recruiting process. One of the key questions that people want to know is, how does a player get noticed by college coaches? While there are many ways to be discovered, the easiest way to get on a college's radar is to send a coach an email and provide them all the information they need to assess if you are a player worth keeping their eyes on. That's where the app part of Champs app comes in. Champs app was designed based on all the conversations and feedback we received about the recruiting process, and we built a tool to help players and coaches connect with a ton of the information they want to know. It all starts with creating a free, beautiful Champs app profile. After that, there are some pretty magical things that can happen to help make the recruiting process a little less overwhelming. Your Champs app profile includes all the basic academic, personal, and athletic information coaches want to know. Then, by including video, schedule information, and your coach's contact details, colleges can easily start their evaluation process. You just copy and paste your personalized link and send it to coaches so they can see your public player profile without even having to log in or create a Champs app account. Or you can connect directly with coaches on Champs app. More and more coaches are creating their own Champs app profiles and connecting with players themselves every day. Now coaches can have all the information they need to assess where you might fit in their recruiting plans. Even better, college coaches can track your progress throughout the winter and showcase seasons because as you make changes to your profile, coaches will get notified to your updates. And in the future, we will be adding even more amazing features to improve your visibility to the recruiting process and hopefully increase your odds of success. If you wanna see what a player or coach profile looks like before you start your own, look in the show notes to see some examples. My kids and I have used Champs app for their recruiting process. In fact, my son was invited to a AAA tryout thanks to his Champs app profile. So go to www.champs.app and start your player or coach profile. It only takes about 15 to 20 minutes to complete most of your key information. Good luck, and please let us know how it helped with your recruiting journey.